welcome to WebPixel Live. Um, my name is Adam Handley, and um, I'd like to introduce my co-host for this episode. Um, hello, Alex. Um, hey, Adam. Good to see you, <laughs> good to see you too. Um, so today we're going to talk about um, some ideas of things that we can do um, to practice underwater photography when we're not actually underwater. So some important ideas that allow us to get better pictures once we get in the water. So, Alex, what, what, what ideas have you got for, for underwater photographers that are currently dry? Well, yeah, well, I'm one of them. I, I've not been diving for for, well, for a very long, well, three, three, three or four months now, it feels like. I don't know. I haven't been counting the days. Um, <laughs> Much. <laughs> but one thing I've always said to people is, while you may only be an underwater photographer for, you know, maybe a, a couple of dozen days in the year, we remain underwater photographers actually 365 days of the year. And we can improve our skills as an underwater photographer and certainly our mindset as an underwater photographer a great deal between those dive trips if we stay engaged with the hobby. So I think that's something that's really valuable. And it's something that, you know, I've definitely tried to do during lockdown of, you know, working or keeping active as an underwater photographer. And I'm packed now full of ideas waiting to get back in the water. I think the first thing that I would say is really important is use social media as a gallery for seeing fantastic underwater yeah. photography. On Facebook, get into some of the really popular underwater photography groups. WetPix one is, is, you know, without doubt, one of the best ones. Because then you just get a whole range of photographers from all around the world submitting amazing images. And obviously, the most liked ones tend to rise to the top. So yeah. you see all the really good stuff. I'm also a really big fan of Instagram. Get on there, follow lots of good underwater photographers and again you just have this daily feed of amazing underwater photography i think i think with social media, sorry. sorry sorry i think with 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 uh, with the facebook particularly in the groups the groups are a really good way of accessing a big a large amount of, of underwater photography and also obviously you can click on the the people that have submitted the images and go to their galleries and see so it's a really good kind of central point of finding inspiration yeah it's it's really really good yeah yeah. And, and then, you know, definitely also traditional media. I, I think I would particularly like looking at books, not only because you can go out, sit in the garden in the nice sunny weather and, and enjoy them. But I think also there's something about a really carefully curated collection of work, particularly when it's from a single photographer mm -hmm. and it's got a real style and, and, and you know, they, there's a lot of thought into it. I've really been revisiting some of my, my favorite photography books during this lockdown. Anyway, I should probably get on to number two. Yep. Um, and back on, on the internet again, back staring at your screen, but there's been some fantastic online content produced during the lockdown, and it's gonna be there for years, and I really, really think that's a fantastic resource for underwater photography. The, the guys at Underwater Tribe have been doing almost, or been doing three times a week, an amazing daily show, getting big names from underwater photography, hearing their stories, talking about imaging, loads of really great information there. Ocean Geographic have been doing something similar, a little bit more of a conservation bias, but have had some really great photographers on and, and, and hearing their talk stories. Yeah. And, you know, it's fantastic. I've seen, you know, some great photographers speaking on those channels yeah. who I've never had the chance to see speak at a dive show or anything. So it's been a fantastic privilege. Another one that's been really helping people during lockdown is Ask Erin webinars, where Erin has been um, running online Photoshop and Lightroom processing classes. And the archive of all those free lessons is actually up there forever now. And people, you can actually pay and down, down, download them and keep them as well. Yeah, I so think, I think those that's, three I'd, I'd really highlight. That's Erin Quigley. And, and she, she, she's a Go Ask Erin. So if you, if you Google Go Ask Erin, it'll take you to her. Um, but I, I did a couple of her, um, her webinars and they've been really, really good. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. 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 About you, have you been watching anything interesting online, Adam? So I also, I also um, photography related. <laughs> yeah, I, I can. I think in some ways we can learn a lot of things from people outside of the underwater imaging industry as well. So, so I've been 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 um, watching Andy Rouse's. Andy Rouse is a UK-based wildlife photographer. Um, yeah, very watchable. And, and 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 a bit of a bit of a character too. But but um, yeah. but yeah, I mean a lot of the stuff he does, and it, it's really interesting to see how a lot of the, the principles that we apply underwater actually apply to wildlife photography in general um, and and he's quite, quite a, he's quite a, has quite a good way of of distilling some of those ideas particularly things like field craft but also just technical stuff too using lights um, so I, I think you know we can also broaden the search a bit a little bit more and, and look at more generally probably um, great photographers that we like I guess they don't have to be wildlife photographers um, but you know if you've got a portrait photographer something you really like it's worth spending some time um, 
you know, checking out their, what they're up to as well. A lot, a lot of them, Nikon are running some free feeds as well, which are pretty good. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the other manufacturers are doing likewise. So, so there's lots and lots of opportunity. I think we live in a fairly unique time with, with the volume of, of, of tutorials and, and information that's fairly readily available. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, we kind of need someone to kind of publish some article with links to them all, actually. You know, uh, someone who's actually watched them cause, and sort of point out which are the really, really worth watching ones because there's almost too much content now. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, I think my, my third point would be enter competitions. I know photo competitions run all the time, but actually now is actually a time when people maybe have got a little bit more time to actually get some pictures together and get them out there. No. And, you know, you might find, surprise yourself by having some prizes to use come the other side of things. But there's lots of competitions still running. Um, dig into your archives, dig into pictures from previous trips and, and get them out there in, into the contest. I think it's a fun time to get involved in that, that world. I think the, the other thing about contests, obviously, is it gives you a good way of gauging your imagery compared to others as well. So, so it has a it has a really good function, not just in terms of the prizes you might win and the glory, but also in terms of being able to compare the quality of your images to to other people's. And I think that's a you know, that's an important tool. It's a really good learning experience as well. A really good way of of of, of getting make, creating better images for sure. Yeah. yeah, and I think, yeah, sometimes people are a bit frustrated. You know, you certainly, I read a lot on Facebook or Instagram, people going, you know, oh, such and such gets more likes than me and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and actually, you know, a lot of that is to how how much you promote and, and, and get involved with your social media accounts, not how good your pictures are. Yeah. And I think competitions do provide, you know, some sort of um, objective measure of your, of your progress as opposed to social media likes, yeah. which are fairly... Yeah. Uh, you know, no measure at all. No, a, a photo so cute and cuddly that's you know will probably get more Facebook likes than something that's not. As simple as that. And um, no, and, I, and what I see in my work is when it's shared on big channels with loads and loads of followers, it gets you know loads and loads of of of, of, of likes and feedback. Yeah. When it's shared on on, a, on my channel where it's not got many followers, it doesn't. So it's nothing to do with yeah. the quality of the pictures. Yeah, yeah. It's really the size of the audience. Yeah. Okay, my next one um, is don't lock your camera away. Yeah. I think that's a real, that's such a common mistake, whether it's just between dive trips or whether it's in a time when we can't travel and dive like, like at the moment. I do think that, you know, underwater photographers have a habit coming back from a trip, housings go into, into storage, cameras go into cupboards, and they don't come out again until the next trip. And you really can learn so much about your camera, keep all those skills in the front of your mind by just getting it out every now and again, you know. It's the summertime in the Northern Hemisphere at the moment. There's loads of you know, flowers in bloom. Great for practicing your macro photography skills. Um, my wife loves, loves orchids. and We go out into meadows and things and look for wild orchids. And you know, she, she gets the, the, you know, my 60 mil 105 macro lens, goes down and, and shoots all those. And a lot of the skills are very similar to underwater photography. And you can learn a lot from doing those things. Yeah, I think I think you know there's a combination of things because it's also a good time to delve into the computer, into sorry, to the cameras menus and go to places that we don't normally go to because you know it gives us the option of, of trying things out that normally we probably wouldn't go near. So you know, look at look get get into the into the camera manual, buy a couple of textbooks for whatever model camera you've got, dive into it, and see what you can find in there because you'll surprise yourself. There'll be stuff in there that you didn't know the camera could do, and that's this is an opportunity to do that. And and one of the things that, that I think you make really well in your book, Alex, is is you talk about this idea of um, of being that, that time is such a precious commodity underwater and anything we can do on land that makes us more efficient underwater is to our advantage because inevitably we only have so much time underwater both in terms of holiday time and air time and all the other issues so so being really familiar with your camera being happy and comfortable when you get in the water with how your camera works and what it does this is all stuff we can figure out on land i mean you can even get your housing out if need be and play with your housing on land and your strobes and everything else get all that stuff dialed in and then when you're ready to hit the water it's all set up and ready to go and the muscle memory is there you know what you're doing it's it's a it's a no-brainer it's it's, it's the Mm. It's probably it's probably the, the the easiest free diving you'll ever do. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not as much fun though. No, no. <laughs> and then I, I think my final one, and it's something I've done a lot during these last few months, is process pictures. Particularly dig into old archives, have a look at your pictures. I think we often can get a little bit hung up as photographers about get excited about what we've just shot. And sometimes on a trip, you know, you go on a dive and you, you do some stuff and you're like, oh, it didn't quite work the way I want it to. I don't really like those pictures. And then you come back, you know, a year or two later and you look at those same pictures and you go, you know what? These are actually really nice, really interesting. And I think also you've got to be aware that your taste as a photographer changed down the years. So, you know, I, I definitely find pictures that I maybe shot 10 years ago, which weren't favorites from the trip. 
And now, as my tastes have changed, they, those pictures have become much more to my, my, my liking than the pictures that were at the time my top rated pictures. So it can actually be really nice. And getting back into those files, finding those old pictures. Also, I think as our processing technologies improve, yeah, like Lightroom updates come out all the time, Photoshop improves, and then our own personal processing skills improve yeah. all the time. Yeah. Certainly, if you've been watching Go Ask Erin's um, <laughs> yeah. webinars. Yeah then I, I think that you can actually get more out of some of those old files than you realize. And I think that can also mean a picture that at the time you're like, oh, that's kind of a missed opportunity, can suddenly become something that you can really get working really well for you. And I think that ties neatly in as well, the whole idea of inspiration. You'll see someone else has produced a picture on, on Facebook or Instagram, wherever it may be. And you look at it and you think, well, I've got a picture like that. And then you can take that picture and possibly reprocess it and discover, you know, it's a really good way of teaching yourself um, how to, how to get the best out of your images. Yeah, I quite agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Well, that's, that's my, that's, that, those are my first suggestions. So Yeah, perfect. Well, th thanks for that, Alex. I think they're very valuable. Um, if people want to see more of your work, where do they need to go? Um, I guess Instagram is the easiest place, although I haven't posted anything for a couple of weeks, but I'll <laughs> get back on the case soon. And on there, I think I'm Alex Mustard One, but if you, I'm sure you'll find me if you type Alex Mustard in. And then my website, actually, a lot of people don't go to websites much anymore, but if yeah. you go on my website, I actually have a fully searchable image database that's open to the public. A lot of photographers kind of put them behind a password wall, but my one is open. It's got, I think, 7,500 pictures on there, all keyworded. So if you're going somewhere on a trip, you can type in a destination and see some of my pictures from there. It might give you some ideas or at least give you a flavor for the sort of subjects you might be able to shoot on that trip. That's an awesome resource. Thanks for that, Alex. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much, Alex. We'll, um, we'll see you soon. And just to thank again our sponsors for this episode, which again is Cape May Diving Centre. We're very appreciative for them helping us to create this episode. Um, and um, please feel free to make comments, suggestions for future episodes, and likes, so on and so forth, in the, in the comment sections below um, here on YouTube. Um, thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you again soon.